help you pick the right stock at the right time. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live. I am Jayesh Kilnani and let's look at what the trade setup looks like this Friday morning. If you have a look at the US market and how they closed, it was a positive close for all three indices uh, with gains of about uh, more than half a percent for the Dow Jones itself. And uh, Europe largely closed uh, mixed in trade. But if you have a look at the Asian indices uh, that have in fact opened on a strong note uh, with the Nikkei trading about uh, more than half a percent higher and the Hang Seng also so, you know, trading positive to the tune of about 50 odd points. Now, if you look at uh, the SGX Nifty, that too is indicating a positive start to the tune of about 37 points. But remember that yesterday the SGX Nifty was trading and did manage to close higher by about 47 points. Uh, so, the actual open may be more than this uh, that we are expecting in terms of the points that are there. Now, if you look at uh, some of the other cues that we got in terms of uh, the uh, Indian indices and how they closed on Wednesday, uh, we are had a positive close for the Nifty and the Nifty Midcap Index after two straight sessions of uh, losing. In fact, the Nifty had lost more 300 points in the first two days of the week, and that made a comeback of about 82 points. Uh, but the Nifty Small Cap Index that remained under pressure for the third consecutive day. As far as the Bank Nifty is concerned, that also managed to inch higher, but just about uh, 12 odd points in the green. While the Nifty PSU Bank Index that surged about a quarter of a percent. Uh, as far as the gainers are concerned, we had the Nifty FMCG Index which managed to uh, you know, close positive to the tune of about 2.5%. And we had Nifty Metals also, which closed positive, more than 1% gain for that as well. Now, if you look at the ADR picture, we had the banking space, which was in focus. ICICI Bank and HGFC Bank led the gainers, followed by the IT names like uh, Wipro and Infosys. Not much to talk about when it comes to the losers in the ADR space, except for Tata Motors. That was down about uh, nearly four-tenths of a percent. Now, if you look at the con uh, fund flow numbers, uh, the FIs, in fact, have sold uh, more than 1,000 crores worth of equity, while the domestic institutions pumped in more than 500 crores. For the month itself, uh, the larger trend continues. FIs have been net sellers of about 340 crores, while domestic institutions have bought equities more than 2,100 odd crores. Uh, having a look at uh, the contribution, what led to the 80-point uh, uptick in the Nifty, it was largely led by the heavyweights ITC and Reliance, which contributed the most on the upside, while we had banking names, Axis Bank and ICICI Bank, which managed to put some pressure on the Nifty itself. Now, if you look at uh, the FNO space, what actually happened on the futures and options, uh, there was a short covering rally on the Nifty itself. Uh, there was a premium of about 47 odd points while the Nifty managed to surge about 0.7%. Uh, uh, but there was a shedding in the open interest or by about 2.3%, uh, suggesting there was in fact uh, short covering. Uh, Nifty Bank itself, uh, there was no uh, not, not major move coming in over there, uh, but we had a premium of about uh, 160 points and it, uh, the open interest managed to surge nearly half a percent. Now, as far as uh, the individual uh, strike rates are concerned, uh, the maximum call open interest lies at 11,800, while the put open interest lies at about 11,400. So that's the broader 400-point range that uh, you know the market participants are expecting the Nifty to trade in. As far as individual strikes are concerned, 11,600 uh, 11, calls saw the maximum uh, you know, shedding of open interest, while we had uh, put open interest shed in uh, 11,500 uh, uh, strike price. Uh, moving on to the India wakes, uh, we had uh, you know a sharp sell-off in the India wakes, uh, largely owed to the uh, short covering rally that we saw, 7% uh, downtick for the India wakes itself. As far as the put call ratio is concerned, uh, the bulls seem to have come back in the market. Nifty PA PCR moved from 1.25 to 1.29, while the Nifty Bank PCR that actually moved higher to about 0.68. Uh, versus 0.58 that we had in the market. Now, if you look at uh, individual stocks, what actually happened was uh, uh, on Balram Bocchini, the stock went up about 2.4% on high open interest built up, 18% open interest change for that uh, counter. Uh, we had uh, Bata India, which also saw some uh, you know long positions building up uh, with open interest surge of about 9.9%, and the stock went up about 1.7 uh, odd percent. Uh, as far as Repco Housing Finance is concerned, we had uh, the stock, in fact, uh, went down 
down about uh, uh, 4.6%, uh, while there was open interest, uh, you know, built up of about uh, nearly 13%, indicating that there could be some short positions that are getting uh, created in the market. Uh, but that's as far as the domestic news is concerned. Now let's go across to Paul Allen for the top international headlines. Multiple casualties are expected after a series of gas explosions triggered fires at 39 homes north of Boston. Entire neighborhoods were evacuated as fire crews cut gas and electricity lines. The explosions happened in the late afternoon rush hour, causing gridlock across the area. The cause of the blasts isn't clear, although Columbia Gas has said it would be upgrading supply lines across Massachusetts. The leading edge of Hurricane Florence has reached the Carolina coast, bringing strong winds and torrential rain. It's been downgraded to Category 2, but is still forecast to deliver more than a metre of rain and a four-metre storm surge. Florence is seen causing damage worth $20 billion. More than 1,000 flights have been cancelled, and Duke Energy says 3 million people could lose power. Meanwhile, the Philippines is bracing for the most powerful typhoon of the year. Forecasters expect Manhut to hit northern Cagayan province on Saturday with sustained winds of 265 kilometers an hour. It's been rated a super typhoon and is projected to maintain that strength when it makes landfall. Thousands of people have been ordered to seek shelter and government offices and schools are closed. Bloomberg's been told that foreign investors were front of mind for the BOJ as it introduced forward guidance. Sources say the headline to the bank's July 31 monetary policy statement was written first in English rather than Japanese, which is not usual practice. Officials were said to be concerned that adjustments being announced that day could be overseas as stealth tapering. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Paul Allen. This is Bloomberg. There's a lot of focus right now on Iran, but also on emerging market demand in particular. So far, we haven't seen any negative impact on demand across the world. Yes, there are pockets of weakness, such as, say, in Turkey, Latin America hasn't been great. But remember, a lot of Asian countries are also shielded from the currency depreciation, such as Indonesia. Uh, and India's economic growth is just so strong that we just haven't seen the impact from negative uh, or weakening currency or uh, very high prices. So, so far, it's still very, very solid oil demand growth. Well, at least if India and China is safe, it makes you feel a little bit better if you're an oil bull. But if you do take a look at the countries that have been hit, like in Argentina, uh, like a Turkey, for example, or like Brazil, their oil demand isn't nothing. I mean, we have a chart that shows how much they wind up uh, consuming. Uh, yeah, okay, India obviously the most, but nonetheless, it's something. What would you be looking for to be a trigger for some material downshift in demand? I think the countries you mentioned, of, of that, of course, Brazil is very important as well. Uh, but I'd say that the biggest issue over here is that if there's contagion that spreads, then we would be very, very concerned. Now, of the countries, you know, the Fragile Five that they're known, um, even including India, you're looking at about uh, 10 million barrels per day between all these five countries. China alone consumes 12, right? And Chinese demand actually right now is growing because the country is doing a lot of stimulus. So I don't think there's a lot of risk there. But in terms of what to watch out for, um, I would say the trade war is something we are following very, very closely because that can uh, really become a bigger deal if, you know, the, the U.S.-China relationships yeah. and the trade war that's going on, that doesn't de-escalate. Uh, but beyond that, it has to be contagion, a banking crisis, across Latin America and across Europe. That's what we are watching for. Shifting focus to currency and commodities market, uh, talking about Indian rupee first, it recovered from its all-time low on Wednesday uh, after, and strengthened against the US dollar after Bloomberg reported that the government may announce measures to halt currency fall in an economic review meeting which is scheduled this weekend. A uh, home unit ended 7 tenths of a percent higher at 72.19 levels against the dollar, thereby snapping its two-day losing streak on Wednesday. That apart, uh, speaking of the bond market, sovereign bonds gained as a 10-year benchmark bond deal dropped 
five basis point to end at 8.13 percent uh, that apart uh, if you see on the economic data front uh, CPI came in well below state expectations at 3.7 percent in the month of August which is well below RBI's target of 4 percent for this fiscal year now this was despite the fall in the in the currency that we have seen and hence traders believe that uh, RBI is likely to hold interest rates in its uh, October policy meet uh, that apart on the global front uh, dollar index uh, ended lower for the second straight day and it now trades a steady uh, well above the 94.5 mark in the early Asian hours. The dollar was largely weighed by lower than expected CPI print uh, which came uh, yesterday. However, odds of a September rate hike looks fully priced in according to a Bloomberg survey. Uh, that apart, Euro rose to its highest level in over two weeks two weeks versus the dollar after ECB monetary policy meet wherein the central bank uh, kept the interest rates unchanged and committed uh, to end bond buying program very soon and also if you see pound it uh, extend its gain for the fifth consecutive session versus the dollar after Bank of England held rates uh, but expressed optimism over UK economy and lastly speaking of dollar rupee now it is trading at 71.90 levels against the dollar in the non deliverable forward markets which indicates a positive positive opening for Indian rupee in today's trade. Having said that, let's shift focus to commodity space. Uh, good morning, Jayesh. What cues are you picking up? Morning, Saloni. We're picking up mixed cues uh, as far as the entire commodities basket is concerned. Let's start off with oil prices, which were under some bit of pressure. WTI in the overnight session declined about 2.5% on the back of uh, supply concerns and a uh, tweet by Donald Trump. Uh, so IEA in fact uh, has said that uh, uh, you know it's uncertain whether the Saudi supply will in fact make up for uh, the Iran shortfall so we'll have to wait and watch uh, how the entire supply demand situation pans out uh, but as far as uh, the Trump tweet is concerned uh, we had uh, one in which he has mentioned that China is under pressure to negotiate an agreement so those are the two negatives uh, for uh, the oil markets and hence the decline uh, but uh, you know this actually had a positive rub off effect on the base metal space which in fact gain for a second straight day on the London Metal Exchange. Copper was at a two-week high on the back of easing of the trade war concerns. And as far as other base metals are concerned, we had aluminium, which was unchanged, uh, while we had uh, tin, nickel and zinc, which uh, declined on the London Metal Exchange. And lead was uh, higher by about uh, nine-tenths of a percent. Now, if you look at the Shanghai Futures Exchange, most of these base metals have, in fact, started on a positive note. As far as precious metals are concerned, we had some bit of decline in the gold prices, but not much, uh, still holding on above the 1200 mark. Well, amongst the stocks that we're tracking in trade today is HCL Technologies, which has announced a buyback aggregating to 4,000 crores. Uh, overall, they've said that um, the offer will open on September 18th, and the buyback price has been set at 1,100 per share close. Uh, that's, that's nearly uh, close to Friday's, uh, Wednesday's closing price. I'm sorry. So uh, that's one stock to watch out for. You also have RCF, where the uh, cabinet has uh, approved um, the sale or transfer of land of RCF to MMRD and MGCM. They've also approved the selling of uh, transferable development rights which are receivable against this transfer. So uh, positive uh, news for this company. You also have Vedanta which will be in focus. Uh, the company has said that they encountered indications of hydrocarbons during their drilling evaluations. Uh, nevertheless, they have said that they are yet to evaluate potential commerciality of this discovery. So let's see how that one reacts. You'll also have the Sriram group of companies at the Sriram Transport Finance and Sriram City Union Finance, which will be in focus. Now, the group entity SVL, which is Sriram Ventures, has been admitted into the bankruptcy process on September 10th. Now, both these companies, uh, where Sriram Transport had a uh, off, uh, on and off balance sheet exposure, both the companies have exposure to SVL, and uh, hence uh, we will have to see uh, what happens to the corporate uh, guarantees, whether they are invoked or not. Uh, previously, both the managements had assured investors that the liability will be borne only by the promoters, but let's see how uh, and what it will mean in terms of NDAS provisioning for both these companies. So. Uh, until there is some clarity that emerges, uh, there could be some pressure on both these names, so watch out for uh, these stocks. Uh, Adani Enterprises, now according to Bloomberg, uh, they've said that they will shorten the rail line to the planned Carmichael uh, coal mine in Australia to save costs. It will help them save uh, uh, $1 billion uh, dollars 
post this Australian dollars post this move so let's see how this one reacts five pesa capital limited has approved the rights issue and they have fixed the price for the rights issue at uh, 80 rupees which is a sharp discount to the current market price so you could possibly see some negative reaction there and finally you have a PTI report which says that Patanjali is looking to enter the dairy business and they're eyeing sales worth a uh, thousand crores in the next fiscal so you will have uh, dairy stocks like Prabhat Dairy, um, Parag Milk and Hatsul Agro as well which will be in focus. With our mobile app, we have uh, you know tens of millions of customers that use that on a regular basis, and and that's one example of the need state of convenience. We just launched a pilot with Uber Eats in Miami, where we're now uh, sort of beginning the journey to to really understand how to deliver, how to get in delivery in a way that would deliver the quality that we expect of our Starbucks food and beverage to customers. Uh, China is another place that delivery is huge. You know, we just announced. A, a major partnership with Alibaba and uh, one of the dimensions of that partnership is the delivery with a company called Elema. And so in Beijing and Shanghai uh, just this month we're lighting up delivery in those two cities and we'll have over 2,000 Starbucks stores in China doing delivery by the end of this calendar year. Is the trade war at all impacting your business in China? You know not yet. I mean we've been very focused on on the products but it's it has not been uh, anything that has been impactful to us yet we continue to monitor for that you know I think we've been in China over 20 years now and we've been in China uh, in a way that we think uh, China has been built in China for China we stay very close to these things but it has not been an impact to us at this point so you just did a huge 7.3 billion dollar marketing deal with Nestle how will this kickstart expansion abroad you were just in Milan opening a store there yeah our global coffee alliance with Nestle is is all about taking uh, our roast and ground coffee and our packaged coffee, as well as bringing Starbucks to the Nespresso and the, and the Dolce Gusto platforms and taking it uh, globally. Today, we have a very healthy business in North America with roast and ground and uh, uh, single serve coffee in grocery and mass merchants, and we're now going to take that globally. You know, we're, we're going to continue to, to run the Starbucks uh, retail stores, but Nestle is going to help take our coffee to grocery, mass merchants, and food service services on a global basis. The issue was Lehman was this marvelous mortgage machine. Now, it was also a fixed income power around the world, right? Now, we know that one of the, the, the issues with fixed income is it's not liquid, right? The market is inherently not liquid, which means the, the, the market makers have to provide the capital. So Lehman was more leveraged than the rest. Lehman relied on a lot of short-term funding. They, and by the way, the rest of the street believed that repo, or the secured financing, was rock solid, would never, <clears throat> never go away. And of course, when the fire started in mortgages, it spread elsewhere. Well, what are the firms that you're going to hit first? Right. You're going to hit the mortgage players. And those were Bayer right. and, and, and Lehman. In the case of as we were getting to the, right. the, to the end there, L Lehman made the bet in 2007. Remember the crisis certain What was the bet they made? They made a bet that this liquidity event, the, 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 the mortgage market falling, was a, an opportunity. And you actually see, if you track, that their balance sheet rises through the beginning of 2008. <laughs> exactly. By the way, that would work nine times out of ten in a liquidity event. If you have enough liquidity, you could right. li you could live through it. You'd make money. Okay. They didn't. But, they, but this is important. The fancy guys like you escaped the wrath. Mr. Fold, I saw. I think ten days before uh, the collapse, he was exhausted. Yes, but you know what? Life went on. The image we have are those backs against the glass wall is they told the kids goodbye, and then we had the idea of the kids walking out with one cardboard box. I mean, that's the video media images we have today. Are those kids going to walk out of a bank again like that? Are we going to move on to another Lehman where they, the fancy people move on, but the kids can't? They're destroyed? Well, I don't think the kids were destroyed. You know, Lehman was a wonderful place to work. Uh, in terms of the the, the, the front office people, the, you know, if you go to uh, to LinkedIn, you'll find you know the this Lehman group of alumni are just loyal as can be, even to today. Yes, I the, noticed. The, that. the issue with Lehman was that I I landed in Milan 
on the Monday that Lehman filed for bankruptcy. I was going on a marketing tour. Now, I knew Lehman was in trouble. That was the subject on everybody's lips, and I was hitting the European markets. While I was in the air, Lehman was, it became clear that Lehman, I, I landed, Bernstein set up an 1,100 client conference call. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, the rest of the street is burning, so none of the equity analysts could talk save me, which was a wonderful thing to work at Bernstein at that moment. So I'm on the call. What was the message that came from, from all of those 1,100 clients? It was huge fear. Why did the Fed allow it to go? So there was amazement, there was fear, there was disbelief, and who held Lehman exposure was the question. And th that explains Were what Geithner, happened. Were Geithner, Paulsner, Bernanke, were they wrong? Should terribly have, wrong. Should they, should they have come in like Bear Stearns? They didn't have to save the Lehman equity holders, but they needed to make it less of a crisis because if you don't know, if I don't know whether you had Lehman exposure, am I going to lend you money? No. Mm -hmm. And it was that uncertainty that caused everybody to pull in. They pulled in their financing, and it led to the crisis that, 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 that occurred later. You know, we have a, a recent book that came out, and the book was uh, was by by Professor Ball, who makes the argument that the Fed had the power to save Lehman. But certain whether, whether they had the power or not is not really the issue. The issue is, should they have? And they should have. It would have. They would have. It would have made it a much softer crisis. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to save the people. Once a very rare gem, vast diamond reserves were found in South Africa in the late 19th century. Diamond diggers line up ready for the word go in the latest South African diamond rush. One of many prospectors seeking to make their fortune was Englishman Cecil Rhodes. He formed the De Beers Company in 1888 and eventually took charge of much of the diamond trade, including mining, supply and distribution. But diamond sales dropped off during the Great Depression of the 1930s. So De Beers turned to another burgeoning industry for help. In 1938, De Beers commissioned ad agency N.W. Ayer and Son with making diamonds a necessary luxury in American lives. De Beers' grip on the supply meant that whoever sold a diamond was likely selling one of theirs. The agency went to Hollywood, tasking producer Margaret Ettinger with reinforcing the image of the diamond as integral to love. She influenced changing the movie title Diamonds Are Dangerous to Adventure in Diamonds, and she supplied jewellery for stars like Mel Oberon and Claudette Colbert. By the 1940s, as America's men went off to war, the number of marriages started to rise. Between 1938 and 1941, diamond sales went up 55%. In 1947, AIR copywriter Francis Geraghty came up with the slogan, A Diamond is Forever, and the association with eternal love was solidified. It's appeared in every De Beers advert since 1948, and it's been heralded as the advertising slogan of the century. What the slogan did was create the concept that a diamond ring would be kept by the betrothed for eternity, creating a special sentiment, but also meaning fewer would be resold, therefore increasing the chance for De Beers to sell more freshly mined stones. Before the Second World War, 10% of engagement rings contained diamonds. By the 1980s, the number was up to 80%. Over the same period, diamond sales in the United States grew from $23 million to $2.1 billion. De Beers and N.W. Ayers and Son's marketing masterpiece played on our emotions so powerfully that not only were they able to sell us a product we didn't need, but they influenced the culture of marriage. All right, several stories like that one on the website BloombergQuint.com. Not just that, you'll find all the live market action over the course of the day on Bloomberg Quint Live as well. But 
Here are a couple of stories that you should consider reading on the website as of now. Justice Ranjan Gogoi was on Thursday appointed the 46th Chief Justice of India, according to the Law Ministry. And Baba Ramdev's Patanjali Ayurved was uh, announced that it's uh, uh, forayed into the dairy segment by launching milk and milk products, including curd and cheese, targeting sales worth 1,000 crore rupees from the segment. That's all you need to know going to trade this Friday. Up next is Indian Open, so do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Point.